so now, first session of this afternoon is the third academic session, and it's about uh, hospitality and technologies. And I would like you welcome uh, Mr. Cyril Lorezac, who is the new director of École de Savignac France. Cyril Lorezac. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like also if you uh, introduce, and I will introduce after a short introduction of the thematic, Javier Delgado Muerza, that I want to thank very much for taking the time to be with us today. It's an honor to have having uh, Javier with us, mm -hmm. uh, and I will tell you a little bit more before giving him the floor. So I will introduce the topic, and then we would like uh, with Javier to be uh, as dynamic as possible and so uh, during his presentation or to keep a time where we can uh, address several questions with the audience uh, we will be pleased to, to do that. I would like to thank Philippe Francois to give me the opportunity to address the theme hospitality, tourism and digitalization and especially at Amfort to reflect on what hospitality management schools should care for the key decisive components we need to train future professionals how to harm them, to harm them, to, uh, to address a wide vari variety of issue, issues becoming more and more complex and predominant for any business, especially hospitality, tourism and travel. Technology is increasingly present in our lives. Hotel tourism professional must take, must take into account several new challenges, including security, privacy, the cost and the human dimension of the data they have, but also deepen and strengthen their capacity to manage the usage of technology through the angle of hardware and software infrastructures. Address online communities, company websites, social media networks, and travel websites contribute to hospitality facilities tax on transparency. Address mobile technology, in 2023, the number of mobile internet users is estimated to amount close to 300 million people. Address sharing economy. This could be through peer-to-peer -peer application, collaborative platform, or shared marketplace. Address sustainability. Constantly developing environmental technology to reduce cost for hotels and restaurants and improve efficiency. Address personalized guest experience through smart technology as well as marketing. More globally, mastering its distribution and its digital marketing, be well protected through cybersecurity, and managing well data appear as the three most crucial issues. In my opinion, regarding data science, there is a serious issue of training to be addressed in hospitality management schools. Educate professionals and future professionals on how to manage and, pro and protect customer data of employees, guests, and providers is crucial in a very defragmented industry and through various regulations around the world. Last but not least, there are also possibilities for the use that are multiplied, multiplying robotics, home auto automation, artificial intelligence, metaverse, virtual reality, and the ever-growing Internet of Things connecting devices that communicate with each other. In conclusion for my introduction, technology will increase efficiency, data, decrease waste, automatization, and should not be visible for the guest, service-focused, mainly by replacing secondary tasks, but not the guest interaction. Data, 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 but also privacy, privacy, privacy. Technology to, to entertain, technology to save cost. At this stage, now, so thank you for, um, now I would like to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, way more expert than I, to give you a specialized overview. Javier Delgado Muerza is currently manager, partner, and CEO EMEA for Mirai. Mirai is the leader in the industry for direct distribution assisting hoteliers to regain control of their distribution by being less dependent on OTAs. Half of the, a billion dollars of revenue through 14 offices around the world and 200 employees. 
created 35 years ago and based in 35 countries. Javier originally obtained a degree in hospitality management and culinary art has and has been working in travel tech since the late 90s. When he started working at the catering division of Iberia Airlines as a management trainee and also as a porter at the Lutetia. Yes. <laughs> After this experience, he joined Globalia, where he led the creation of a new business line. Between 2000 and 2003, uh, Javier lived in Paris, where he obtained an MBA in hospitality management from Cornell and ESSEC Business School. Upon graduation, he joined Expedia, where he spent eight years in different capacities based in Brussels, Madrid, and Rome. In 2011, he was hired by Google to lead the travel vertical in Spain and the top accounts team in Europe. At Google, he also led the company commercial effort in vertical search in Europe. And actually, Javier was also part, was the Google representative for the Organisation Mondiale du Tourism uh, during two years, uh, in, in those years. Following his seven years at Google, he moved at Mallorca and joined the executive board at Iberostar, a family-owned hotel with over 100 hotels accounting 37,000 rooms in 20 countries. At Iberostar, Javier managed all the digital and commercial operation for three years. Prior to joining Mirai, Javier has obtained a, a certificate from MIT. So thank you so much, Javier, for being with us once again. I leave you the floor, and I might uh, uh, play the role and ask you a few questions during your presentation. And please uh, raise your hand. Uh, we want this uh, presentation to be as interactive as possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. Merci à tous. Merci à toutes. Thank you, uh, Philippe, uh, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, for the next, if we can get the slides for you. For the next hour, uh, I will be sharing with you um, my perspective on the impact of digital. Uh, in the world of uh, travel and tourism. By no means this is going to be a full comprehensive presentation uh, because it would take us days, if not weeks, to talk about the importance of technology. In any case, I would like, you to, uh, I would like to address together with you a few points. Uh, please rest in contact with me should you need uh, to get in touch with me. Here you have uh, my details. Uh, it will be my pleasure to get back to you. So, uh, slide. Before we start, um, a disclaimer. I have a flight taking off in two hours from now, so I need to stop at 3.15. Uh, uh, click again, please, Xavier, <laughs> because I need to get back to my family. I left uh, on Monday at 7 a.m. I've been in London and Paris the whole week, so I really need to get back home. So we will need to stop pile poil at Cancel Counts. All right? Uh, slide. Thanks very much for all the supporters that are making this um, great meeting happen. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Slide. So the theme of hospitality, uh, tourism, and digitalization, as uh, Cyril, it's a very vast topic. Let's delve directly into it, and let's look back, actually, a bit of history to understand how uh, technology has been embedded in tourism everything, uh, ever since it started. Um, technology has played a great role in travel in general. Let's think about the compass, something that tells you where to go or where you are. Very simple. Um, actually had an impact from the very beginning of the first uh, travels. This is an astrolabe and a compass from the 14th, 15th century, similar to the ones that were used by Columbus and his crew to discover America and the world. So technology has been at the center of travel and innovation for decades, if not um, thousands of years. Now, after the Second World War, it's when mass tourism really took off and it started happening using the surplus of the aircraft and the different uh, bits and pieces that came out of the war to make people travel and discover the world. Uh, for the last 70 years, people started using different publications, think about National Geographic, uh, think about Le Guide Michelin, uh, to decide where to go, what to do, and they had to use timetables, things um, that we've seen actually in the past. So basically people wanted to understand where to go, how to get there. Basically, there was always an agent in the middle. We had the traveler and we had the supplier, the hotel, the rental car company that would make the connection happen between them. So in the 50s and the 60s, we start uh, seeing 
all of these data points being connected in very simple ways, basically through paper. People needed to go from one place to another, but they had no knowledge about it. As we move through time, we started uh, seeing the importance of data. This picture comes from uh, the previous one, sorry. Uh, this picture comes from the 1950s. It was the first data center created by American Airlines. Um, actually, airlines needed to organize their inventory and make it available to the world through um, the travel agencies. That's how uh, the SABER system was created, Semi-Automated Business Research Environment. That's what SABER stands for. It's a company that still exists, and it's a leading GDS. And that's how data is started building into uh, the travel industry. Think about city pairs, Paris to London, Paris to New York. Think about timetables. Think about hotel prices. Think about room categories. Think about all of those things. All of those things are data. And it's been the key point of contact between supply and demand, between origin and destination. This is a screen that some of you might be familiar with. These are the GDSs. I remember when I started working in, in this industry in Globalia, I remember, actually, you should be able to interpret this if you're old enough, <laughs> right? This is a flight from Seoul to Bangkok in Asiana Airlines. The screen is pretty ugly, but it made the deal, right? It's ugly, but it worked because it was giving you the information about the availability and the pricing on a given flight. Now, where we are today is a very different world. We have a website. This is a, sh a screenshot from Expedia website yesterday evening. And the user has the ability to make a decision in a much more informed way. You have information about the hotel. You have information about the flight. You have information about what's contained or not. Now, if you can click on the image. No, previous one, and click on the image. Yeah. Now we're just gonna run a short video that explains how all of this has changed through time. So we were talking about the compasses. Got some downtime waiting in line for your morning coffee? If you, can bring, if you can bring the volume just a bit uh, down. Yeah, I'm playing. Why not plan and book your next big trip with uh, destinations voila. on Google? Just Think about the compasses that we talked about that were used to navigate from Europe to the Americas, then about the brochures, then about the GDSs. And this is the experience today. You have people that are bringing this to you, like Google, where everything is combined. You are combining user-generated content. You are combining pricing. You are combining pictures. You are giving the user all of the power to make a better decision based on the combination of data, imagery, and content. Think about travel in the 50s. Now we are almost in 2023. How things have changed through time and the impact this is having in the user and in the travel industry. And this is powered by data. This is powered by technology, even though we sometimes don't realize. The experience is becoming much more seamless, much better for the user who makes better decision based on real-time data, which needs to be updated in a constant basis. Traditionally, basically, uh, everything was static. Now everything is dynamic. So things have changed dramatically. There is a very interesting fact that uh, we used uh, at Google during my times there. Um, people are more worried about getting their vacation wrong than getting their mortgage wrong, which means you're not gonna sign, you're gonna, not gonna buy many houses in your life, but people are more worried about taking the wrong decision when it's a family vacation than maybe paying you know, hundreds of thousands more because of um, getting the wrong mortgage, which means the importance of travel and the importance of having the right um, information to make an informed decision. Again, data is at the heart of everything we do in travel. Think about payment methods. We had traveler checks. I used traveler checks and I'm 45 years old. I remember them. They were very uh, normal until very recently. Then we had uh, credit cards. Now we have bitcoins and systems like Google Wallet, which are actually the use of data to remove friction from travel. So all of this is technology working at the service of travel. Here you have uh, a few screenshots from uh, Google products that are also helping the user make a better and informed decision. Compare this experience on a mobile phone versus the brochures and the posters uh, that we saw uh, a few slides ago, we're, we're, which were the main source of information to make a decision back then. Now, this takes me, as a 
brief introduction to the three main areas we're going to talk about today. Data, coupled with connectivity and blockchain, new forms of reality and how it impacts the travel industry, and back, back, new forms of intelligence. So moving on to data. Uh, data today is galoring. It's growing substantially all over the world. The Economist actually presented this uh, cover a few years back where we say that oil is, uh, used to be the main um, asset in the world, now it's data. Think about the value of companies uh, 15, 20 years ago, the most valuable companies in terms of market cap, they were oil companies. Think about Shell, think about, uh, think about Total, think about financial institutions. Now it is the likes of Google, Amazon, Facebook, even though Facebook has been uh, suffering a bit lately, but in general, it's the data companies, companies that are able to make use of data that are becoming the most valuable. But data is useless, like oil, if you don't refine it. So data for data, it's pointless. You need to have information, which means data that gets tr transformed into a KPI or into some form of number that I can use to make a better decision from a business perspective. Like um, Clive, the famous mathematician, said in, in the UK, if you don't refine the data, it has no value whatsoever. Now, I would like to ask a question to you that we will come back later on. How important is data in your curriculum as uh, managers or leaders of educational institutions within the travel industry? Because we've thought a lot about uh, recipes and food and service and all the typical things that make up a hotel experience. Data is a key component and it normally gets neglected. And why? Uh, actually, because it's extremely difficult to make sense out of it. The regulators, the users, the providers, the hotel industry in general is having a lot of difficulty. It's like drinking from a fire hose. It's impossible to digest all of this. Let's also, uh, for a minute, think about the impact this is having in consumption. There's uh, a concept called ZMOD, which means zero moment of truth, that I don't know if you're familiar with it. I'm just going to run through it for a second. But it's something that has appeared in the last 10 years by which the consumer, before making a decision, is getting a lot of information. And traditionally, the moment of, the moment of truth in the retail space would be when you are in front of um, a shelf where you have to choose between 50, 60 products different, and that's the exact moment in which you are going to make a decision. Now, if you think about today, before going to a shop, before going to a trip, before choosing a hotel or an airline, you as a user, you have looked at different options, you have looked at different data points to make a better informed decision. This has changed the behavior completely. Before, when you were booking a hotel or a restaurant, you would be using the Guide Michelin or you would be using a travel agent. Now you research everything online. Now the information that you can access is going to change the behavior that you have upon making that purchase. And this has tremendous implications for hotels, for restaurants, for airlines, for the whole travel value chain, like we're going to see in a minute. People are spending up to six hours before booking a vacation. With how many differ different entities are they going to interact? Hotels websites, OTAs, user-generated content like TripAdvisor or others in order to make the best decision going forward. So all of, these, all of these changes in the behavior are making it more and more difficult for the travel players to be in the game, to really be relevant and be present at all times within the funnel. The funnel is considered the phases that you go through when you're making a purchase. And all of this is happening only or thanks to 5G. 5G, the, we all know that it's a phone technology or a voice technology that is actually a connectivity technology that is powering uh, many of these decisions. Why? Because for 5G, information travels much faster and much cheaper, in a much faster and a much cheaper way, which reduces latency. Uh, when we saw that picture about the American Airlines in the 50s, getting a piece of information from Paris to Texas, it could take uh, minutes, if not hours. Now we're talking about milliseconds. When you have the ability to send information in milliseconds from one point to another, first of all, it's much more efficient. Second of all, it consumes much less energy, which means you don't need to put energy everywhere. Maybe with a battery, you can have data centers or small uh, devices running for years. Now, this is going to be a game changer. 
This is just uh, uh, a few examples that are giving you the impact this is going to have. We're having 10x latency, which means 10x decreasing by 10, a factor of 10, the time we need to wait for something. Think about the telex. We've all seen telex in the past. We've all seen faxes, and we thought that fax was fast. Now we're talking about something that is much, 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 much faster, and it's going to have an incredible impact in everything we do in technology. Just to give you an idea, uh, last night I was thinking, how do I explain this to someone that does not come from a technology uh, background? I don't come from a technology background, but I've uh, spent the last uh, 20, 25 years. Think about the first um, locomotive. It was launched about 200 years ago in the UK, and I think it did 15 miles per hour as a speed. Think about the new trains that we have today. They are going about three, 400 miles per hour. So it took us 20, um, sorry, 200 years to multiply that speed by 20. So 200 years to multiply the speed by 20, okay? We are all familiar with trains. Think about the move from 5G to 6G. 6G is going to be present, it's already uh, being tested in some areas in seven years from now. It's supposed to be developed and deployed globally by 2030, seven years from now. It's going to multiply the speed at which we can consume and share data by a factor of a thousand. A thousand. If I did the math correctly, five hours is about 36,000 seconds. Today takes five hours to download uh, 20 terabytes. It's going to take 18 seconds to download a terabyte. Think about the impact this is going to have in the amount of data that we can generate and that we have to collect and interpret in real time to make better decisions. And again, you may think, no, this has nothing to do with me because I'm training people for the hotel world or for the catering world or for whatever it is. I'm sorry to say you're wrong. This is going to have a great impact in your organizations and in the people that you are training for the future because this is very important. And we might not realize what has happened. Think about cybersecurity. One of the biggest problems that humankind uh, is facing because a lot of data means a lot more possibilities to hack that data, to use that data wrongly. British Airways, one of the leading companies in the, uh, in the aerospace, they uh, had a data breach which costed them, which costed them about $200 million. This is uh, two years ago. Marriott, same story, major data leaks. This is a very big problem. CEOs of companies, I run a company. Again, we have revenues for about 500 million uh, euros. What keeps me up, up night? Is it invoicing? Is it financing? Is it collecting the money? No, it's cybersecurity. And it's not only me. Focus right report, uh, sorry, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper report from this summer. For the uh, French CEOs, what's the number one worry today is cybersecurity. Even more important than uh, um, risk sanitaire, volatility macroeconomic, number one thing that comes to mind for a CEO that is running a company. And if I may, uh, Javier, do you have uh, different businesses in France and I know in your countries that has been hacked. Hospital are being hacked right now in various countries. Banks. So it's not even banks, everything, but imagine hospitals. <laughs> it's happening all over the place. So this should be a main worry for you as at your organization as well. And you should train people and make them, make them wary about the risks that come together with this. This is a report that was issued actually uh, 10 days ago by Microsoft. I can send you a copy if you want. Just send me an email and I'll get back to you. Look at uh, the two things that I have highlighted here. It's uh, previous one, sorry, uh, attacks have multiplied by a factor of five from last year to this year. Another important uh, piece, one third, 32% on the right hand screen, you can see that the image that is loaded on your devices, which means your phone, your computer, your tablet, they have at least 10 vulnerabilities, which means you can be attacked, you can be hacked, and your information can be stolen. This tends to be neglected because we all like to talk about artificial intelligence and all the cool stuff, but this is really important. The same way you keep the money at the hotel in a safe, the cash, you should think about uh, stewarding your data because it's as valid as your cash. Moving on to the next point, new forms of reality. So we saw those pictures, those posters from Cannes and London and Spain, different destinations that were used as the main key points of uh, motivation or inspiration for the traveler. How has this changed? Um, today. 
Well, imagery, imagery, pictures have been at the center of humanity. The first m forms of communication for uh, 40,000, uh, sorry, 40, yes, 40,000 years ago were images, were paintings done in caves. Think about five years ago in Egypt, again, it was not words, it was imagery. 100 years ago, video became uh, popular. And um, video imagery in general is much more popular. The problem is that we moved to text because it was easier to convey the messages, to convey the knowledge. You know a lot about knowledge. You are running uh, hotel schools all over the world. And it makes it simple to transmit uh, a concept, to hold knowledge, bibliotheques. That's why we uh, develop them. But video is much more powerful. And we see with the 5G that we mentioned that it is becoming much, much more easy to share images, videos, information, because there's m more cellular phones with better Wi-Fi, with better cameras. And as humanity, we're moving back to imagery. Think about if you have children who are between 15 and 20 years old, they're using TikTok. They're not even using Facebook because video is much more powerful. What does this mean? This is a picture of me. Uh, I was thinking about buying a boat. I went to the boat store. And instead of looking at the engine, or the, the, the boat itself, they gave me a pair of glasses that made me uh, make an immersive experience. And I was able to literally boat and drive that boat. The power that you have through imagery is much, much more than anything you can do on a brochure or looking at the specs. And that's how things change. Think about the most expensive restaurant in the world. It's open, it's been running for about two, three years in Ibiza, Spain, beautiful island. And everything is based on combination of different uh, inputs. Uh, if you can click on the image, yes. It's actually combining gastronomy, which is, of course, uh, a key aspect of this, because it's a restaurant at the, at the end of the day, but also mixing virtual realities with augmented reality. And as a result, this is no longer a restaurant. You're sitting down to have an experience that it's enhanced by 10 times, by maybe 20 times, by combining all of these new technologies. This is a two-star Michelin chef who has this uh, restaurant full every night when it's open over the summertime in Ibiza. We're not going to watch the full video, but keep, keep on going for a bit maybe. Uh, but you get to see the experience. You are surrounded by technology. Again, you are eating. But maybe the food is one-third, one-fourth, or 50% of the experience, which gets completely enhanced by the use of, first of all, technology, and second of all, data. So this means that things are changing. Obviously, we're not going to see these restaurants all over the world. But if we're looking for the avant-garde, where are things, the new things happening, the, the new products being created, is actually by combining virtual reality by combining data with the traditional dishes. Of course, there's a cook. Of course, there's a whole crew preparing an absolutely amazing food. But it gets combined in different ways to provide a much better and a much more enhanced experience. If we can move uh, back to the slides, uh, Xavier. Thank you very much. So you get uh, an idea of how the experience looks like uh, when you go to this restaurant in Ibiza. Yeah. It's actually a big party happening through light, through food, through music, even through odors that get uh, injected into the, into the experience. Slide. Think about the consumption of hotels. I'm particularly um, proud of this uh, product that I'm going uh, to show you now. I was uh, running Iberostar Hotels and Resorts as a general manager. And during those days, I had people in my team who said, Javier, for the last 20 years, you've been able to choose your seat in an airplane because you could see a simple structure of the different seats, and you say, well, take 1B or 23C, whatever it is that I get to choose. Why don't we start developing something similar for hotels? If you can click on the image from the previous one. Oh. This is what happened. We took all of the data from the hotel, and we took imagery, and we combined availability and data to provide this experience. If you can go down, scroll down a bit, you get to see the property. And not only that, you get to choose uh, a specific room. There's another uh, video right bef below. Keep on going. 
yeah, I clicked that one. Let's click there. So this opens a whole new uh, experience. About what? Well, first of all, I am consuming the hotel in a completely different way. As a hotelier, I can say what's a, what's a double room, what's a suite, what's the price for each one, what's the price difference between the one and the other. We even created filters for people to decide, do I want morning sun or do I want evening sun? Do I want to be next to the pool or do I want to be next to the restaurant? Which means you're opening a whole new array of possibilities. Traditionally, you would make a room based on the, remember the GDS screen? Flat screen in, in, in awful colors that you should decide what is the room type that you want to get. Well, all of this is changing, once again, powered by technology, powered by data at the service of hotels or restaurants. Back to the slides, please. Beyond the um, business opportunities that this brings, which is, are many, it's actually the expectation of the consumer that is changing the most. Think about the zero moment of truth that we said, when, that we spoke about. If you're choosing between one tomato or other tomato, not very relevant. When you're spending $10,000 on your vacation with your wife or with your husband and kids, you want to make the right decision. All of this is powering, and that zero moment of truth becomes much more relevant for the consumer if, you, if we combine correctly data and technology. This may look like NASA. This may look like, you know, the maybe air traffic control in Brussels. Companies, marketing companies, are looking more and more like this. I've been uh, to a company, a leading retail company, I cannot disclose the name, that had a room which is very similar to this. They were tracking. It's a global operator selling uh, clothing all over the world. And they knew, where's, the, the, where's my truck? Where are the new jackets? What's happening in India? Hotels, sorry, uh, shops opening in Rio de Janeiro, shops closing in New York. The, if you leverage data, you can be much more powerful. Click. This is actually what stands in between the traveler, who's at the top right, and the service provider. It can be a hotel, an airline, or whatever it is. I'm not going to get into the different boxes that uh, contain this slide. But the point is, it's extremely complex. And this ecosystem has be becoming more and more complex in the last five years. And you know what? It's going to become even more complex going forward. Now, you as leaders of the, f the leaders of the future, because you are training people, are you making them aware? I'm sure you spend days if not weeks talking about Escoffier and gastronomy, which is extremely important for the business of uh, hotels. Are you even thinking about technology and the implications it has? My guess is that probably not. Or not enough. Or not enough. Think about um, artificial intelligence. It sounds very sexy. No one really knows what's going on. Let me give you an example about what's going on. Everyone knows, or most of you should know, um, Booking.com one of the leaders in, uh, as a distribution platform in the world. This is a change from their website in 2007 to 2017. And you say, well, Javier, you know, it didn't change that much, and I agree with you. It's actually very ugly. This site I do not like at all. But this is the number and one. And not your friends. No. <laughs> but again, this is the number one platform in the world. And Artificial intelligence, these people are doing A-B testing, which means we're going to show half of the people one experience, the other half, the other 50% another experience. And see what converts better, see what performs better, see what sells more. So they are using algorithms to optimize constantly their retail operations. Click. As a result, this company has grown in valuation from $7 in, 2003, in 2003 that's when I joined Expedia. Booking was a competitor at the time. Stock value of Booking.com, $7. A stock value today, almost $2,000. Think about the value that has been created through time. Does this company have any asset whatsoever? Do they own a hotel? Do they own any brick? No, it's just servers, technology, at the service of distribution. If you click now, you see that the market cap, the, the value of the company as of yesterday, it was 75 billion with a B, 75 billion dollars. If we compare this with a few leading companies, think about Marriott, Marriott, Starwood, 60, sorry, 
6,500 hotels, roughly the biggest hotel operator in the world. Company value about 60 billion, sorry, no, 50 billion, which means booking, which has no assets, no cooks, no receptionists, is worth 50% more than the biggest hotel company, which is holding the assets, building the buildings, you know, creating the experience, but all the value has gone to distribution. Think about Accor. Accor, the biggest hotel operator in Europe. Company value, six billion. So booking is 12 times more valuable than Accor. And Accor has, I think, 5,000 hotels, 50 brands. You know, we're talking about the serious operation. 50 years, if not more, since uh, Dubroul, Messier Dubroul and Messier Pellisson founded the company. Booking.com in 20 years has done more and created 12 times more value from a financial perspective. Why is that? Because of the use of technology and the use of data. Is Accor a bad company? Of course not. Great company from Mama Shelter to Thermont to EBS, great brands, but they are not as valuable as the right use of data. Slide. If you think about restaurants, which are in some cases, as we will see in a minute, uh, sometimes anchored in the past. The restaurant uh, technology ecosystem is also becoming more and more complex. Again, I'm not going to get into this wheel and the different aspects, but you have uh, the menus, the technology, the marketing, the reservations, all of these companies, and this picture was taken in 2019, this diagram. It's only getting more and more complex. My favorite slide of this presentation, which I created for you, this is Casa Botin. If you are familiar, if you've ever been to Madrid, this is one of the oldest restaurants in the world. The oven, the four, has been running since uh, 1725. They never uh, extinguished the fire in the oven. I know you went to La Petite Chess yesterday, which is supposed to be very old as well, I think from the 1600s. It's one of my favorite restaurants in Paris, actually. Um, but look at the, uh, click please, look at the picture on the left. I took this picture less than a month ago. I had dinner there uh, with, with some French entrepreneurs, actually. And look at how the uh, restaurant is run. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nail <laughs> with pieces of paper that get stuck into it. So when the restaurant opened in 1725, 300 years ago, roughly, it was probably through the same system, right? That tells us two things. The restaurateur is a great guy because 300 years is still doing very good with the paper and, and a clue, right? And the restaurant is still there. But think about the amount of money, the amount of value that has been lost. Did anyone ask me for my phone or my email address when I got there? No. Uh, I think we ordered uh, three bottles of wine. Only two of them were in the invoice because someone forgot to put the piece of paper on the nail. Now, we were nice enough to tell the maitre d' You know, there was one more bottle of wine, please add it to the invoice. But what if we didn't? Stupid example, but this is happening today. This picture is not from the 50s. It's, again, less than one month old. In many aspects, the hospitality industry, the restaurant industry is still run, and the mentality behind the processes is still the piece of paper and a piece of nail to stick it to it. This needs to change because the world has changed a lot. Now, maybe you're able to still run uh, your restaurant or your hotel with these systems, but certainly the, your risk of disappearing is much higher than if you adopt the right technologies to be uh, more present in, in today's world. And I'm saying this to you because you lead the future hoteliers and the future restaurateurs of the world. Coming to an end here so we allow uh, sufficient time for questions. This is the pace at which technology is growing, which is the green line, the blue line is the ability of humans to adapt to new technologies, which means technology is now accelerating much more than our capacity to adopt new things. So we are in a difficult place, but the point of this slide is we're going to be in a more difficult place tomorrow than we are today because technology keeps on accelerating. Think about the implications of 5G that we mentioned, Think about the implications of artificial intelligence and what it means uh, for the business world and our ability to learn. And it's not our ability to learn in this room that matters. It's your students' availability to learn what really matters. And we need to accelerate that. Conclusions. This is not an era of changes. This is a change of era. 
like the bronze era, like the iron era, like the oil and the industrial revolution era. This is the digital revolution, which means things are changing, fundamental tectonic shifts that are changing. You need to adapt, like many businesses and many um, things in the world disappear with industrial revolution, many things are gonna disappear with the digital revolution. Think about tour operators. I remember the demise of Thomas Cook, the oldest tour operator in the world, disappeared three years ago because they were not able to adapt to technology and consumer behavior change. Now, the use of data has always been key, always been key for the travel industry and the restaurant industry, always. But the lack of that data literacy, which means having the most basic aspects of data, understanding spreadsheets, understanding basic things of data analysis are more important than ever. Maybe you've lost that train. I consider that I've lost that train and I've been in technology for the last 20 years working for leading companies like Google or Expedia and I consider myself almost dead from, uh, from a data analysis perspective. Now make sure that your students don't miss the train and make this an important piece of, um, of your curriculum. Hospitality is about people. It's people buying from people, it's experiences, it's food, it's uh, hotels, it's travel, it's experiences. But if you combine the right data and the right technology with the human component, like we saw in an exaggerated manner on the Ibiza example, or on the hotel verse <coughs> example to book hotels, you get much more value. And this is what the customer expects. That's the key thing. Why did hotels lag back in distribution? Because hotels in, in 2003 didn't have websites. Booking came along and created those websites for them. And look what has happened. It has created a fortress that is now much more valuable than the hotels themselves. The distributor is more important from a financial perspective than the product owner, the product <coughs> maker. Final questions for you. Were you aware of all of this? Did you knew before uh, this presentation that all of this is happening now, uh, around you? Or have you discovered anything, in, uh, th anything new? Are you uncomfortable? Because you should. <laughs> you should be somehow uncomfortable knowing that all of this is happening and how you need to change to adapt to the new reality. And are you adapting to it? Are you really doing something? Or are you just going to go and you know, have a um, dinner tonight at the gala dinner and think, oh, yeah, you know, the data and all of that? That doesn't go with me. Mind me saying that you should reconsider if that's uh, your thought. And lastly, but most importantly, is data and technology something that you're spending time on devoting time and resources within your schools to make this top of mind? Because I'm sure you're spending a lot of time in marketing, very important, certainly. Culinary arts, very important. Service, very important. Mind me saying that data and technology are as important. So you should bring it up in your organizations to make it something relevant and important for you. Mirai, what do we do? We help hotels sell more. I'm not gonna bore you with that because that was not the topic today, but we give hotels power through web, through connectivity, booking engine, and so forth. One more. Mirai is the big company we have launched now. Mirai is cool to help companies understand and adapt to all of this, and also Mirai Consulting. So if you want to know about it, just send me an email and I'll be happy to assist you. Now, that's all for me. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been my pleasure being with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. We, we, we do have still 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I do have many questions for Javier, but I would love that maybe does any one of you have any questions? Mathieu? Thank you very much, uh, brilliant presentation. Um, indeed, we, were, we live in the world of data uh, and so on, and uh, I just wanted to reflect on uh, uh, the part where you were showing, and I love VR, okay, uh, with the hotel, that technically the consumer, you know, will project himself much better towards, you know, the future holidays that he's aiming for, all right? Now, my question is how we are gonna make, you know, the right balance that, in the eye of the consumer is going ahead, you know, to an hotel that is present, presented brilliantly, you know, with, you know, uh, and it's almost like a dream. Now, when it comes to service, okay, then uh, because we are teaching, you know, the, the, you know, the people for service uh, for tomorrow, you know, the, the human service, how do we 
make sure you know that after the consumer is not going to be disappointed when he arrives in the hotel and you sold you know all that magic because that has no limit but when it comes to service and human being unfortunately we do have one so that's that's uh, you know i wanted to get an answer the danger of you know presenting something so brilliantly and after being on the spot even on luxury level we all have our limits as well so um for me, it's a kind of um, a danger. How are we going to teach our students to make sure that they understand that uh, we are selling this product this way today, okay? And uh, uh, how are they going to serve well our guests, you know, in, in regards of not, you know, obviously disappointing the guest? Great question. Extremely difficult to answer. I know. I'll give you my best shot. And um, let me start with a philosophical answer first. I believe that everything in life is about managing expectations. Absolutely everything. Think about the, the McDonald's effect. Um, McDonald's, great brand, no, no discussion about that, but we've all seen pictures of McDonald's burgers or Burger King burgers, right? They're beautiful, fresh, inviting, they look succulent, they look amazing. And then you get to the counter and what's put on your plate has nothing to do with the picture absolutely nothing to do with the picture. So that's the gap you're talking about. I've been promised this and I'm getting that. Now, if we do things right and we use technology right, we should be able to explain the reality of the product. Now, coming back to the Hotel Verse example, uh, traditionally hotels in the brochures, they had their best rooms with the best views done by a professional photographer, right? And then you would get to that same hotel and you would get the room looking to the back alley uh, and the trash cans with the rats running around, right? And he said, well, I made a decision based upon something else, and now I'm getting this. If you use technology right, you are able to bridge that gap and make people better understand what your product is. Now, the service point, I think that's the most difficult point. Why? Because it's about humans. And let me give you an example of something that happened. Um, when I was uh, running this hotel company, uh, we deployed... Um, a predictive service as to who the people that were going to check in were. So we had the name, obviously, Javier Delgado, the system, the robot would go to uh, LinkedIn and other sources of information, and it would gather a customer profile. So the receptionist upon arrival would say, oh, Mr. Delgado, we know you are CEO of a company, or we know you have three children, or this and that. Now that's supposed to enhance the experience and give you better service, make a better connection between the humans. The problem is that sometimes people didn't want to disclose what they were doing or why were they going. Now you have children and wife, and maybe I'm not going to that hotel with my wife. Now, makes sense, uh, I won't get into that, but <laughs> <laughs> point is the experience was not um, ideal, right? You are trying to enhance an experience by having more information about a, a human being, an individual, saying, oh, how was your trip and how is your business at whatever doing? and you got it completely wrong. So that's the artificial intelligence or the artificial stupidity because nothing is going to replace you know, the eye of a human being understanding. To your point, I think service will always be about humans to humans. But if you have a better information, example, stupid example, I go to a hotel in London um, and every time I checked in, they asked me to s fill in the same card. I said, I've been here 50 times. Why do you keep on asking me? You know me by heart, you know my name. You should have my passport on file. You should have even my credit card on file. Why do I need to fill in again? I've been traveling you know, from Seattle, 12 hours of flight, and I need to fill in again this damn card. That's, that's not the right use of technology of information. And now that's providing a bad service with someone that could have been, with something that could have been replied uh, through technology and service. To your point, I think the human touch will always be there. Robots cannot replace uh, humans, but it's making the right combination of data and technology to make a better experience and, and close the gap. Mm -hmm. Javier, I don't know if you agree, but I think as well what is very important, be it a school or be it uh, for the development of uh, digital, uh, be it a hotel, it depends also on the organization. How do they address the issue of data with the employees? Uh, there is wrong and there is good doings. So the, the main question is not about having data or not, it's not having even storing data well, but what do you do with it? How do you define the goals that you do with data? 
if you do data for data or technology for technology, it doesn't make sense. How do you integrate, even in a school, PMS, CRM, LMS, what do you develop? Blended learning, lifelong learning. You, you have so many usage, and we're post-COVID in an era where we need to ask ourselves the good question. But the problem, like hoteliers for schools, we are a very defragmented industry with a lot of PME, very small companies. So where do you start with? <coughs> Maybe do well something. I mean, we are going to launch uh, our, for Savignac our first uh, modules on uh, hybridation uh, on a certain topic, and we are going to also enhance and develop data, yes, data science in, in our master. So when you say we, we teach service, at what level of students as well? Where do you put it in, in, in the pedagogy? At which stage do you, do, do, do you put it? All those questions are crucial. Mm -hmm. Because service, uh, do we teach service or do we teach emotional intelligence? But, uh, hospitality is about cognitive skills. A and that's where data can, can help. So I don't know Abs if you... Ab absolutely, yes. Let me give you an example. Um, a hotel company that is investing serious amounts of money into CRM. They are taking one of the leading CRM solutions to combine the data, slice and dice the data with the objective of predicting the um, nationalities of the guests that were going to come on the following months. Why, were they, why did they want to do that? Because they wanted to uh, cater better services. If it's Germans, they're different to the Spanish, to the Portuguese, to the French, to the English, we all know that. So if you know that you're going to have your hotel full of Germans, you probably need to ca buy a different kind of beer or bacon versus the Portuguese, right? All makes sense until there. Now, this company, leading company, I want to give you the name, um, invested in a, a premium in a premium CRM. Now, when the CRM started working on the data and mining the data to provide insights, actionable insights, it came back that on the months to come, the first nationality who do you think was going to be? Portuguese. No. <laughs> this was a, a hotel chain running in Spain. So UK, France, Germany are the three main feeder markets, right? It was Afghanistan. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the PMS, we all know what a PMS is. The first country that appeared on the, on the drop-down menu for nationality was Afghanistan. And the receptionists, every time they were doing a check-in, nationalité, c'est quoi? La première, boom, Afghanistan. <laughs> now, great example of the use of technology. Technology does not solve base problems. If people are not trained in the right way to capture the right nationality and they're just entering la première, um, it's not going to fly. It's not going to work. So data has to be clean in order to be actionable. And that's you know, a good example of how things get wrong, and it's the service, and it's the focus of the people that are running the product, that it, it needs to work for it to work. Uh, oui? Yes? Sorry. So first hand was over there. I do have a question regarding the, um, the choosing the room inside the hotel mm -hmm. because I think it's a good idea. <laughs> really, it's a good idea because it's a big issue for receptionists. Yes. Uh, but also maybe uh, it gives less flexibility to hotelier because now in hospitality we, <laughs> we are making a lot of uh, change, you know. Uh, a room, it, it's not just selling selling a, a, a seat. It's selling a room and you have guests inside. Sometimes they, they, they leave later. And so I think that uh, I, I, I understand the importance of data, but I think data has to help the operations. And maybe here, the hotel, the hoteliers, the people working in hotels, they have to adapt themselves to technology. Just, uh, I think it's a great point that you're bringing, and let me give you an answer for that. Uh, think about the revenue management techniques that have been applied by airlines you know, for decades now, since the 70s. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if you are the CEO of the airline, it's a good thing because you are making 
more money at the end of the year by optimizing your available inventory. If you are myself and you're now going to Orly and you've been overbooked and you don't get to fly, it's not a good thing because I'm not going to be happy and my family is not going to be happy. Now, is that uh, the, the deployment of data and use of technology? Certainly, yes. It does not necessarily result in, uh, in a good experience for everyone in the value chain. Coming back to your question about the choose of the room, it obviously creates a challenge. It obviously creates a challenge for um, the hotel operations, the hotel manager, the receptionist, the PMS. Now, let me answer that uh, thought that you bring to the table very wisely with the following answer. Remember uh, user-generated content, um, TripAdvisor, it's been around for 20 plus years, and that's where everyone brought their pictures, their pictures, the traveler's pictures, where they showed you the reality of the hotel. Was that a good thing or a bad thing for the hotels? Good thing or bad thing for the hotels? Depends the way you run your hotel. Yeah. Well, <laughs> mind, me, mind me saying, Cyril, that that's, that's the wrong answer. It's just a reality. The consumer today in 2023, before spending that the 10,000 euros on that vacation in Cox or in whatever it is, of course you're going to go as a consumer to check not what the hotel is saying on the website because everything is beautiful and avion rose. But now let's see what the others are saying before I spend this $10,000 non-refundable with the tickets and so forth. Now, that's an expectation that the consumers now have. And you need to adapt to it, like it or not. So... I understand your point that sometimes you need to change the operations and change the mindset and change the processes of the hotel, but if you don't, maybe you will disappear. Okay. We have two more questions. Lohez, yes. and then... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Javier, for uh, this presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, just one question about uh, regulation. Perhaps you choose to not speak about that uh, really? fact. I'll <laughs> yes. give you just my but perspective. It is, it is important to, to ask about that because we know that uh, the evolution of regulation and laws go um, uh, very low uh, compared to uh, technology. And uh, the adaptation of management go faster than uh, the adaptation of laws in several countries. So what about this um, threat to uh, technology to use to, uh, of, of data uh, with regulation, the evolution of regulation? How do you think about that? Very good question. Again, it, it, we could spend hours or days talking about this. I'm just going to give you uh, two perspectives on it. As you rightly say, uh, the regulator is always behind the market reality, always, by definition. And unfortunately, I believe that they will always be. Now, businesses uh, in many cases have been developed thanks to regulation. Think about the um, parity rate loss. It's only when Booking.com, after 20 years of oligarchy controlling the digital market, that only in some countries in Europe, France was the first, followed by Germany and, and, and Italy, only 20 years later they decided to intervene and do something. So that gap is always going to be there. There's actually a very big undertaking by the European Union, uh, which is called the Digital Market Act, which gets discussed uh, at the end of the year. It is on December 5th in Brussels. I happen to be invited uh, to the, there are 60 people that are going to be talking about that. So send me an email and after that session I can tell you a bit more about it. Okay. But it is certainly a challenge. Yeah, and unfortunately we run after time, so if we open this door, <laughs> it's going to be a big one. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Th thank you, Javier. Your, uh, your presentation was really insightful. I was wondering, uh, what's your opinion? Uh, I mean, you spoke about uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity. Uh, uh, to a more novice public, where w should we start or where should they start? What's the, the, the bottom or the start? <laughs> because you won't start with uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Agree. I, again, we spent 35 minutes talking about very many different topics, so it was yeah. extremely shallow by definition, right? I just only wanted to make you aware. And I think that's a key point. Where to start? Uh, awareness. You need to be aware uh, about data. Um, I've seen... I, I, need, I live in central Madrid. A few years ago, uh, I was walking by a very big hotel. I won't disclose the name. And on the trash packets, uh, one of them had fallen because of the wind or whatever. And there was you know, a lot of information from that hotel, which included invoices, 
CVs, um, rooming list reports, and it was all over the street, all over the street. Again, this is about 10 years ago. That's because someone in the administration department decided to get rid of all of that at one point, and they just th threw it to the bin, and that bin ended up in the street, and those names, invoices, and all sorts of sensitive information was just literally flying around the streets of Madrid across the UNWTO headquarters, by the way. <laughs> literally, literally. Um, if that happens today in 2023, it means that there's a problem. So data and artificial intelligence, the first thing to understand is that data is like oxygen and that we should be data stewards. We have to keep our guests' data, our own data, in an extremely responsible way, extremely responsible. So to your point, I think the first part of call is being aware that data has value, a lot of value, and it can be very harmful if used wrongly, like technology, same thing. And I don't think there's a collective um, knowledge or awareness about this. So this would be, my, for me, point number one. Actually, I have just accepted the last, last question. Yeah, the very short one. Mr. Uh, thank <laughs> you, uh, Ravia, for the presentation. Very dynamic, very interesting. Um, I just uh, jump on the um, image of the restaurants 200 years ago with the paper technology. And uh, probably what I'm missing from your presentation is like you talk a lot about the, the mean of the technology, but not that much about the purpose. And if we think about uh, this uh, paper technology in this typical restaurant, uh, probably the technology is fitting the situation and is quite performant. So like um, one question you left uh, open and behind is what's the purpose of technology and what extent is improving the performance. And in this case, like in is investing in so much technology materially and uh, the energy we need for it, perhaps the old technology works as well. I agree. Oh. Um, that the, the picture from Casa Botin, again, was taken less than a month ago, and the restaurant was full, and it's making a lot of money. You know, a turnover of probably three million a year, so a nice restaurant, and it works. Now, to your point, and similar to this gentleman's uh, question before, I think that technology and data should be at the service of people to enhance service and make a better experience, not the other way around. The problem is that, to the other gentleman's point, the consumer is running so much faster that we need to adapt to them. And sometimes there's no time. Think about um, La Fourchette, the fork, which got acquired by TripAdvisor, which was part of Expedia. Again, you, you, you see the, the pattern here. It's the response to all the individual hotels that were not able to manage the reservations in the right way. Everything was on a pen and paper, and based on having the chance of getting the line free to speak with the restaurant, speak with the manager who would note down my reservation. Now, this company has started aggregating all of that content and all of that availability and make it uh, usable for the final consumer, right? So what's the point there? It's making a better service. I want to go to La Petite Chess. I don't want to call because I'm in another country or I don't speak French, whatever. I use that technology to know the availability and make a reservation. That's giving me value as a consumer and that's giving value to the other side of the, of the equation, which is the restaurant by better organizing my timing, the people that are going to come, and so forth. But to your question, everything should add value to the final consumer to start with. Because if it only adds value to the hotel or the restaurant, we are starting from the end and not from the beginning. But if, if it doesn't add value to any of the sites, then it's pointless and that technology will never take off. I, I, will, le I will let Javier having the final word. Uh, but first, just on this topic, I'm an ex-revenue controller in hospitality. So for Casa Botin, I will be interesting to calculate the cost of the cost of transformations versus really the revenue on such a small business because size matter to really be able to adopt technology a and, and the human cost. Of let, me, let me give you an, uh, an answer by coming back to the um, market capitalization of, of booking.com. So this company has created 65 or 75 billion billion of value by giving a capability that hotels didn't have and that users wanted. I think no. that answers the question. <coughs> but I'm sure you're right. But what I try to mention here is once again for me, we are a very defragmented industry, same in education. So also uh, any uh, partnership and collaboration uh, towards, uh, because there is many, many, in many schools, I can see right now some various hybridation. The problem is how do you have the means to sustain? Because you need to, s to start 
with the right choice. You, so you need to have the basics. Uh, and not all the school has that. And you also have a penury, a shortage of good teachers in the digital because those people are rare. And that's why we are very lucky to have you today. And that will be my transition because I don't want you to miss your flight. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much, Javier. I'll let you have the final word. But thank you so much for having taken the time to be with us today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Cyril. Thank you very much for having me, uh, Francois. It's been really great. Uh, just think about give the in data and technology should be on your top three uh, points. Like CEOs, we saw in France, uh, Pricewaterhouse, what worries the most is cybersecurity. If you didn't have data and technology on your top five list, I think you are not looking to the future in the right direction or even to the present on the right direction. So give it a thought. Email me if you wish. If I can be of any help, it will be uh, my pleasure to assist you. Thank you very much. Thank you.